Welcome to this webinar on market rent review under the Manufactured Homes Residential Parks Act in Queensland. My name is Gillian and I'm a project worker within the Queensland Retirement Village and Park Advice Service, or Curve Pass for short. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which Caxton sits, the Yagara and the Turrbal people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This webinar is for homeowners of manufactured homes in residential parks in Queensland. The webinar contains general information, not legal advice. I'll provide an introduction to curve paths and guidance from the Manufactured Homes Residential Parks Act on increases to site rent based on market rent review, disputing a proposed increase to your site rent, and how the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, or QCAT, may approach a dispute. The Queensland Retirement Village and Park Advice Service provides specialist advice and information to residents or prospective residents of retirement villages and manufactured home parks in Queensland. It is a free statewide service funded by the Queensland Government Department of Housing and Public Works. Meet John. John bought a home in Seashore Villas, a medium-sized manufactured home park with around 65 homes. He bought his home from a former owner in 2015 for $270,000 and pays site rent of $122.50 per fortnight. He's been very happy so far, although the activities have died down a bit lately and the pool has been off limits due to social distancing. John entered into a Form 2 side agreement with the park, which states that his rent increases by CPI annually, and there is a market rent review every five years. He recently received a letter in his mailbox from the park, which said that his rent would be increasing via a market rent review. There is a report from a valuer attached. John thinks this is unfair as he wasn't consulted. If the park owner wants to increase your rent via a market rent review, they must give you a Form 12 general increase notice. Here is an example for John. We can see that his current site rent is $122.50 per fortnight. The proposed increase is $12.50 with a new total rent of $135 per fortnight. The basis for the increase is market review. And you can see here that the calculation is quite basic um, and, it, and refers to the attached valuer's report. Something like this in a Form 12 will be sufficient if there is a valuer's report attached. Also in part one are some important key dates. You can find this on page two of six of the Form 12. The general increase day for John is the 15th of January, 2021. The date the notice was delivered is the 2nd of November, 2020. And keep in mind that there must be 35 days between the, the date the notice is delivered to the homeowner and the general increase day. Homeowners have 28 days from receiving the the general increase notice to lodge a dispute, which start starting the dispute resolution process under the Act. And site rent increases using the Form 12 cannot occur more than once per year. And you can see here that the previous general increase happened on the 1st of January, 2020. Keep in mind that there are restrictions on market rent review increases in 2020 in light of COVID-19. How these apply depend on the day of the general increase and when the general increase notice was given. However, market rent review increases can go ahead from 2021. You can find out more information about the restrictions in 2020 on our website. Where a park owner wants to increase site rent through a market rent review, the park owner or registered valuer appointed by them must consult with the homeowners committee, or if there is no committee, a proportion of the homeowners at least 63 days before the next increase. Where market rent review is the basis for increasing site rent, the general increase notice, the form 12, 
must be accompanied by a market valuation. John asks his neighbours and finds out about a third of the homeowners have received the market rent increase. It turns out to be all the people who bought homes in 2015. John hears that some homeowners were consulted about the market rent review, around half of those who received it, but the homeowners committee had no idea. The park owner or the registered valuer must consult with the interested entities at least 63 days before the day of the next increase. Interested entities means the homeowners committee for the residential park, or if no homeowners committee has been established for the park, for an increase in site rent intended to apply to fewer than nine sites, the homeowners for at least two, or if nine or more sites are affected, the homeowners for the number of sites at least equal to 25% or a quarter of those sites. Importantly, you must pay your site rent when it is due, otherwise you will be in breach of your site agreement. A site rent increase carried out in accordance with the terms of the site agreement is payable from the day stated in the notice. One exception is if the day in the notice is not 35 days after you received it. If you dispute the increase and QCAT makes a decision reducing the amount of the increase, then the park owner will have to refund any overpayment of site rent since the increased day. For a dispute about a site rent increase, the homeowner must commence the dispute resolution process with the park owner within 28 days of receiving the general increase notice. John can do this by providing a dispute negotiation notice to the park owner. Time limits can be affected if a notice has been posted to you instead of delivered personally or directly put into your mailbox. It is a good idea to respond quickly by providing the dispute negotiation notice if you want to dispute the site rent increase and seek advice if you're not sure about the time limits that apply to you. Dispute resolution under the Act is a three-step process. The first is dispute negotiation with the park. The second, an application to QCAT for a referral to mediation. And the third is an application to QCAT for a hearing. The Act allows a group of homeowners in a park to make a joint application to QCAT if their application arises out of the same or similar facts or circumstances. If other homeowners are also disputing the market rent increase, you can work jointly from the first step or at the second or third stage as long as everyone who wants to join has completed the preceding steps. Generally, parties in QCAT bear their own legal and administrative costs. However, be aware that QCAT can make an order that a party pay and other, the other party's costs if it's in the interests of justice. Skipping a step of the dispute resolution process could be a basis for QCAT ordering you to pay the park owner's costs. This is why it's very important to follow the steps outlined in the Act and not miss any of the three. John decides that he wants to dispute the market rent increase, so he issues a Form 11 dispute negotiation notice. This starts the first stage of the dispute resolution process under the Act. Part one is the parties to, to the dispute. We can see here that his Mr John Jones living in Seashore Villas at Sunshine Beach. He's sending the notice jointly on behalf of multiple people. And he wants to initiate a dispute against the park owner, Mrs. Glinda Goodfeather. Part two contains the details of the matter in dispute. John sets out when he received the general increase notice and the amount of the increase in that notice. He then outlines that he wasn't consulted and sets out why he thinks that the increase is excessive. He draws comparisons with sites in the park itself and also raises some issues with the comparable sites in the valuation report. He notes that the park that's indicated to be comparable is much newer and has a new indoor bowling green and sites which are larger than his site. 
he also outlined some of the issues, some of the steps that he's taken to try to resolve the issue before issuing the dispute negotiation notice. So soon after receiving the general increase notice, he called the park owner to tell her that he did not agree and that he wasn't consulted. He was told by the park owner that she spoke to more than a quarter of the homeowners who were getting the increased notice and because of the COVID-19 measures decided talking to the homeowners committee was too risky. She said the increase is fair because she has a lot of extra costs trying to make sure the park has a COVID safe plan. Lastly, John indicates that he disagrees with the increase and wants to have a meeting with the park owner to try to resolve this. Also in part two, you indicate how you want the matter to be resolved. Here, John says he wants his site rent to remain at the current level, which is what the other homeowners want as well. You also must propose a time and place to meet and negotiate. So we can see here that John's proposed a Zoom meeting with an invitation to follow at 3 p.m. on the 20th of November, 2020. The proposed time should be at least 14 days, but not more than 28 days after the notice has been given. Legislation introduced in 2020 makes it clear that negotiation meetings held by audio or audio visual links, which would cover telephone and using video chat applications like Skype or Zoom, are sufficient for this meeting under the dispute resolution process. If the first step of the dispute resolution process does not resolve the issue, the next step in the process is making an application to QCAT for a referral to mediation. There is a $352 filing fee for this application, which can be waived in some circumstances. Currently, there is no specific QCAT form for making this application. Because of this, you can write to QCAT. You should include your name and contact details, the park owner's name and contact details, that you're bringing a dispute under the Act, including the relevant sections you're relying on. For a dispute about a general site rent increase, you'll be relying on section 70, 108, and 116. The reasons supporting your application, including that the dispute negotiation notice process did not resolve the dispute, and you should attach a copy of the notice you sent, and that you are requesting that the QCAT registrar refer the matter to mediation pursuant to, pursuant to section 108 of the Act. If the mediation does not resolve the dispute, the final step in the three-step process is an application to QCAT for a hearing. Again, there is a $352 filing fee for this application, which you can apply to waive. Again, there is no set form. So you apply to QCAT in writing, including the contact details of you and the park owner, that you're bringing a dispute under the Act, including the relevant sections, the reasons supporting your application, including that mediation did not resolve the dispute, keeping in mind that you cannot reveal anything that was discussed in the mediation in your application to QCAT, as this will all be confidential, and that you are requesting that the QCAT registrar refer the matter for hearing pursuant to section 115 or 115 of the Act. For a market rent review, under the Act, QCAT may appoint an independent valuer to undertake a market rent review of the site rent where QCAT is satisfied of one of the following. Consultation with the homeowners committee or homeowners was not adequate. The notice was not accompanied by a market valuation. The notice doesn't clearly provide how the increase was determined. The site rent increase has been determined other than in accordance with the market valuation. Or finally, that the market valuation does not reflect a reasonable market review. For example, because the basis or methodology was not reasonable. And 
at least 20 homeowners or 25% of the homeowners affected by the increase have applied to QCAT under the Act, whichever is less. If QCAT appoints an independent valuer under this process, generally the park owner covers the valuer's costs. So what may QCAT take into account? This comes from section 70 subsection 5 of the Manufactured Homes Residential Parks Act. And this applies for any consideration of a site rent increase. This is not only restricted to market rent review. So the things which could be taken into account, the range of site rent usually charged for comparable sites in comparable parks in the locality of the park. If it's impractical to obtain that data, the range of site rent usually charged for comparable sites in comparable parks in comparable localities, or if it's impractical, impractical to obtain both of the above cut types of data, consideration is given to general trends in rent for residential accommodation in the locality the park is in. So this will include private tenancies um, for homes and units in the area. The increase in site rent when compared to the previous site rent, the frequency and amount of past increases in site rent, any increase in CPI during the previous site rent period, the amenity or standard of common areas and communal facilities, the withdrawal of a communal facility or service at the park, an addition of a communal facility or service at the park, an increase in the park owner's operating costs during the previous site rent period, whether the increase is fair and equitable in all the circumstances, and anything else QCAT considers relevant. So you can see that QCAT can take a very broad uh, approach to what they consider. So what is the process at QCAT? Common steps in a QCAT matter may include a directions hearing to set out the steps the parties need to follow to, and set out key dates, a compulsory conference where the parties meet and try to work out a way to resolve the dispute, this often operates similar to a mediation um, and a hearing. The tribunal generally requires people to represent themselves. However, you can seek leave to be represented. This could be by a lawyer or by someone else who's agreed to help you. QCAT has to agree for someone to represent you. As part of the QCAT process, you may need to write a statement to tell your story about why you think the increase is excessive. You might need to lodge written arguments called submissions that aim to show QCAT why the increase is excessive and why you should be successful. If the matter goes to hearing, you may need to give evidence or ask the park owner questions about their evidence. At QCAT, the parties to a matter generally have to pay their own legal and administrative costs. However, in some cases, QCAT can order that one party pay the costs of the application. So how might QCAT approach it? QCAT can make a range of orders. They can reduce the increase by an amount, set aside the increase, confirm the increase with conditions on it if appropriate. So this might be that it has a delayed start date, for example, or any other order QCAT considers appropriate. Again, you can see this is quite broad. A recent case of Pretty and others and M and T Entrican um, provides some more guidance about how QCAT may approach it. So this case decided in 2020 concerned a group of homeowners in a manufactured home park who successfully challenged a market rent review increase. A blanket increase rent of $219.45 per week represented a significant increase of between $18 and $25 per week for some longer term homeowners and a much smaller increase for those who had moved into the park more recently. The homeowners argued that the blanket increase was not fair and equitable, given the discrepancy and impact between long-term and newer homeowners. A group of 58 homeowners successfully challenged the increase 
However, QCAT only decreased the rent by $1.95 per week. The case provides a helpful walkthrough of the factors that QCAT will consider when homeowners are challenging a market rent review. Some key points of interest. The task of QCAT is not to determine the market rent, but rather whether the proposed increase in site rent is excessive. In this case, QCAT relied heavily on the Parks Valuation Report, which was accepted as expert evidence by QCAT in relation to both the site rent and the state of maintenance and repair at the park. It was difficult for the homeowners to challenge the rent increase without their own expert evidence. The cost of obtaining a valuer's report may be prohibitively expensive for homeowners, but it would have enhanced their evidence. QCAT also found it difficult to give weight to other arguments made by the homeowners because no supporting evidence was presented. Anecdotal evidence presented by homeowners will carry much less weight than evidence given by a valuer. Although considerable weight was placed on the valuer's report, QCAT applies a methodology different to the valuer when considering the proposed increase. This is because QCAT must consider additional factors as set out in section 70 subsection 5 relating to what is fair and equitable in the circumstances. In this regard, QCAT gave consideration to the comparison between pension entitlements and site rent as relevant to what is fair and equitable. QCAT also considered it relevant to have regard to the site rent people moving into the park were prepared to pay as a fair but not conclusive indication of the market rent. Ultimately, QCAT ordered that the increase be limited to $217.50 per week as recommended by the valuer and rejected the park owner's argument that the increase should be limited to $219.45. This was applicable to all sites regardless of size or existing site rents. So this case demonstrates that homeowners may be at a disadvantage if they cannot provide alternative expert evidence about, about the market rent. The section of the Act which allows for QCAT to appoint an independent valuer, Section 70A, is new and was introduced in 2019. QCAT has considered an application under this section in the case of Wayne and others and Walter Elliott Holdings trading as Palm Lakes Resort. In that case, QCAT declined to appoint an independent valuer, despite a number of issues raised by the homeowners with the valuation. The decision was made on the papers, meaning without an oral hearing, and sets out that many of the issues raised by the homeowners were addressed by the valuer in a response filed in the proceeding. Ultimately, QCAT found that the valuer had provided a reasonable explanation in relation to each of the complaints raised by the homeowners. QCAT determined that without any demonstrated unreasonableness in the valuation, requiring the park owner to pay for a second valuation was not justified. While this decision is not binding for other disputes, um, as each dispute in QCAT will be decided on its own facts and circumstances, it suggests that an application under Section 70A to appoint a valuer is more likely to be successful if homeowners can show that the basis or methodology of the valuation is unreasonable. This may be difficult as the valuer will be considered an expert in this particular area. So back to John. John sent the dispute negotiation notice to the park owner on 5 November 2020, and he and some of his neighbours, Etta, Julie and Robert, scheduled a socially distanced meeting over Zoom with the park owner, Glinda, for 20 November. The first meeting did not resolve the dispute, and then John decided to focus on his family for a while over the summer. The date for the increase, the 15th of January 2021, passed and John started paying the extra amount. 
He also contacted Centrelink to confirm his rent had increased so they could adjust the amount of rent assistance he was paid. Keep in mind that when your rent changes, you need to inform Centrelink within 14 days. There is no time limit in relation to starting the second step of the three-step dispute resolution process. So there is no rush to immediately refer your matter for mediation in QCAT if the first meeting does not resolve the dispute. John and his neighbours decide to send a letter to the park owner asking for another meeting, this time as a group of all of the homeowners affected. Working as a group can produce better results because there may be stronger bargaining power by working together. They set out in the letter why they considered the proposed increase increases were too high and proposing that their site rent only increase to $125 per fortnight. They also noted that they knew they could apply to reduce their rent based on a reduction in the facilities at the park. The park owner wrote back to the homeowners individually. John received an offer to increase his rent by only $5 per fortnight, taking it to $127.50 with the reduced amount payable once he accepted the offer, but no refund of the extra amounts he had paid. John knew that accepting this offer would affect his chance to dispute the increase in QCAT. However, he decided to accept this and sent a letter back confirming the acceptance. So if you receive a market rent review increase notice, where can you go for advice? You can contact CurvePass. You could find a lawyer through the Queensland Law Society. You can search for lawyers who advise on manufactured home disputes. Or if you have a local lawyer or community legal centre, you can get in touch with them. For financial advice, you could speak to your accountant a financial counselling service if you're in financial difficulty, and you can access free financial counselling advice by calling 1800 007 007, which will connect you to a financial counsellor in your area. Or you can talk to Centrelink or the Financial Information Service at Caxton Legal Centre about your entitlements. So how to access Curve Pass? You can contact the reception of Caxton Legal Centre on 07 32146333 to book an appointment. If you would like advice on behalf of a homeowners committee or an informal group of residents, please tell us when booking as you will also need to get a signed authority from the other members of the group.